Okay. All right. Welcome back. And we are looking at Revelation chapter nine today. Uh, last time we finished off, I think, at verse 11, and we're going to be looking at the second half of that quick review of the whole flow. I hope you don't mind the reviews, but they're, it's always good to keep our bearings and mm -hmm. get the context of everything. But going back even to chapter one, so that's on your screen, you can see it. There's this pattern that John has as he's throwing it out there. He has these sevens that are unfolding, and then there's these visions interspersed. So Revelation begins with this vision of Christ, the Son of Man. And then it goes to the first seven, which is the seven churches. If you remember those, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, what's the next one? That's chapter two and three. Uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laod Laodicea, Thyatira. Those seven churches are provide a little bit of the immediate context for the book of those who are receiving the letters. Mm -hmm. And we go back to more visions, chapter four and five. We have the vision of the throne of the Ancient of Days, uh, of God in his glory and holy, holy, very similar to uh, Isaiah's vision. And then it goes to chapter five with the vision of the lamb coming. And he's the one worthy to open the scroll. And that's the drama of this is this scroll. And do you remember what the scroll was? What that <clears throat> represented? Was it the um, deed to the earth? Yeah, it's kind of like a deed or a will, uh, the reading of it. It's, it's just, you know, you're, you're unsealing it. It's now we're going to be act, not just reading what's going to be happening, but it's uh, there's an imminence to it. It's now happening here. So he has this vision and we're dealing with vision. So that, that's important too, to get that. So when John is telling, is unfolding this revelation, he's not He's not describing history to us. It's not like he is describing the future as we would describe the past. He is seeing visions that have meanings that are very important. He's not giving a chronological uh, tour of the future of what's going to happen. You lost your voice. Did I lose my voice? Yeah. You're back you? now. Am I back you? now? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let me know. Let me know if I lose my voice. I don't because I'm I have a microphone that gives a little better sound for the recording, but it may be not connected well. I'm still with you, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Um, all right. So we have the vision of in chapter four and five of God on his throne and then of the lamb. And he's the one who begins to now open the scroll. So chapter six, he mm. breaks the seals, the <laughs> seven seals. The first four were the four horsemen, um, if you remember them, who are mm just setting things up bringing you know trouble to a world asleep and then the fifth seal and i want to remember this one so let's read this one real quick again this is chapter six verses six to ten i i bring it to you because it's it's going to come up again today um so bob Fowler, would you read that uh versus chapter six verses nine to eleven on the screen there sure. when he opened the fifth seal i saw under the altar the souls of those who have, had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord and, tr and true, how long before you will judge the ab and avenge the blood of those who dwell in, on the earth. Then they were, were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. <clears throat> that fifth seal is significant. That's the, the question. That's the prayer request that's going out and that the rest of the seals, the trumpets, the bulls are an answer to that question. How long until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And so this is all the horrors you're going to see or that we've already been seeing are, are an answer to that prayer. Um, and notice where were those souls? How, where, where were they located? Under, under the altar. altar. Yeah, under the altar. Um, that's where they are. Um, and you know, I don't know if you know which altar that would have been. There's a couple altars in the temple area. It would have been the bronze altar. Um, yeah, it, it was not actually, it was not the bronze altar. That's where the sacrifices were. 
but the other altar. Oh, the, oh, the altar of incense. Yeah. Altar of incense, the golden altar where the blood of the <laughs> sacrifice was brought in. And it was, that's where the prayers <laughs> rise up, like incense before the Lord. So they're there and, uh, and they're crying out. So that's the fifth seal. He breaks the sixth seal and nothing really happens. It's just a setup, a clearing of the stage. And everyone's waiting now for the seventh seal to be broken. Um, so that was chapter six. In chapter seven, we had that interlude. Something happens in chapter seven of great importance. Before he opens that seventh seal, something must happen. If you remember what that was. To mark all of the... Uh... Mark the foreheads of all of the, the saved people. Exactly right. So all those who belong to God, that, that 144,000 is not a literal number. It's a symbolic number of all who belong to God who are put with a seal. And we're told that that number is, is, not, is not one particular nation. It's a great multitude from every nation. Those who belong to Christ so that the, the judgments that are coming are not falling upon them. God is very particular about when his judgment and wrath comes. We all go through trouble, but for those who belong to God, we do not go through wrath. And if you remember, that's what Romans 8 talks about that. Um, and so it says, I want to pull it back with you here. Let's read that real quick. Uh, Liz, if you take a look at this here and read for us um, uh, Romans 8, 31 to... Uh, 39. Sure. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is condemned? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And, and there you see in that passage, you know, we're reminded throughout the scriptures, what is it that Christians can expect in this world? In this we don't time? have any more sound. I, lost so can, I can hear him. Oh, we can hear him fine. Okay. I can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I think it's only Liz that can't hear you sometimes. All right. So, um, can you hear me? I mean, I mean, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is what I meant to say. Yeah, yeah I can hear now. Yeah. Okay. Good. Sweet. Um, so, in this passage here, what can you expect? What can we as Christians expect in this world? Tribulation. Tribulation. Mm. Distress, Stress. Persecute. persecution, persecution. Hey, famine. And perhaps even famine, nakedness, maybe danger, sword. Uh, we're like sheep to be slaughtered. Mm -hmm. you know, expect all that stuff. But what also are what are we promised in this passage? What will we not experience? A separation from God. The exactly. wrath of God. Yeah. The wrath of God. Yeah. yeah. There is no condemnation. God oh. is justified. No one can condemn us. Mm -hmm. No charge can be brought against us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. That's mm -hmm. what we're guaranteed in this life and the next. And so all those things that come to us, they're all part of God's plan. They are not a sign of his wrath against us. Um, they are, we're told actually that's a sign of his discipline and his love for us. Mm -hmm. Nothing separates from his love. So that's what we see in Revelation is 7 is a beautiful picture of that where God is putting his name, putting his seal on his people. And you're going to see that that's when he starts opening up that last seal, that the troubles that, that the, when the wrath begins to come, it is not coming upon those that are sealed, those that are his. 
So Revelation 8, we got into the seventh seal is broken, and there's that silence in heaven for half an hour, all eyes are on him, and with that seventh seal, now we open that seven, now we begin the seven trumpets, and the first four trumpets were um, of sort of earthly matters going on, earthly judgments of, you know, hail and fire, a lot of fire going on here, fire and blood, and uh, but you'll notice if you remember in the first four trumpets, um, there was a, a, a number that kept coming up in each of them. A third? A third, yeah, a fraction. What, what was that meaning? Why only a third of the earth, only a third of the sea, only a third of the waters? Partial judgment? Yeah, yeah, it's partial. It's, it's not the fullness. It's just the, the beginning. And, and just like in God could have um, rescued the Israelites from Egypt and punished Egypt in one moment like that. He could have done it like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, but he doesn't. He took 10 plagues to do it. Why does he do it that way? Why, why this partial? Why not just come and take care of business? Do you remember? He's waiting for people to go to him. Yeah. There is this, it's a, it's a sign of his patience mm -hmm. and his kindness that even in, as he's beginning to unfold these measures of judgment, um, there seems to be, at least in this, this stage of the game, opportunities for people to repent, which we're going to see they, they actually don't. Um, but you really see God's patience, and you also see the depravity of man as you unfold it. All right, so those are the first four. Then the eagle cried out, and you think that's bad. Wait until the next three uh, trumpets blow. And so we move now to chapter nine. Last week, we did the fifth trumpet. And, uh, um, and this was a different kind of judgment now, if you'll notice, it was, it was of a different realm. Uh, what happened in the fifth trumpet? Let's, let's read that again, just to remind ourselves of that. So Rob, would you read that for us? Uh, verses one to 11, just to remind us of the fifth trumpet from last week. Good. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only the people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, he is called Apollyon. Yeah. So in this section now, it's that the angel blows the trumpet, and, uh, but the focus is on who is it that sort of unleashes these locusts, they, these beings from the bottomless pit. Um, who's sort of who's leading the charge on on the fifth trumpet? Well, the angel of the yeah. We have the angel of the bottomless pit, who was also referenced at the beginning as the star fallen from heaven. Um, and our best guess with that one um, is who would that be? Satan. Yeah, that would be the devil, prince of demons. Um, and what he's unleashing is that the bottomless pit, the abyss, uh, this is, um, if you remember, the, the bottomless pit, another word for it, is the abyss. Um, 
And that's exactly where the demons were telling the Lord, don't send us to the abyss just yet. That's where they were contained uh, and held up for this day when they would be released to torment people. Because these are not real locusts. I mean, you know, you know he's not talking about literal locusts um, because they're not acting like locusts. I mean, what do, what do locusts do? Eat all the green stuff. <laughs> exactly right. They eat all the green stuff. And these locusts don't. They don't eat any of the green stuff. Uh, they were told not to harm the grass or the green earth or green plants or any tree, but only their whole, whole focus is like, like locusts who are just um, overwhelming and, and just saturating the field are and designed to torment um, those who do not have the seal of God in them. And so we had that scene. It was a, really a, a terrifying scene. The focus now, that's why these woes are so great. The folks, the first four woes, the, 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 the focus of the, of the trouble was not directly aimed at mankind. It was against the creation. And that certainly would have effects upon mankind. Just like when in Moses's day, the first plagues all sort of focused on uh, the land, the, the water turned to blood, the, the bringing the gnats, bringing hail and afflicting the land. And then the last judgment, the focus now shifts to directly on the firstborn sons of Egypt. Um, and so you see this, the shift is now happening. But this fifth one doesn't bring death, does it? No. no. It brings torment. Uh, and they'll seek death, uh, but they won't find it. They'll long to die, but death will flee from them. So it, it does remind you of... Uh, uh, of Job's situation when the devil was allowed to do business with Job. What is he allowed to do? What is he not allowed to do? Mm. You know, what was the, what was Job's situation when God permitted the devil to afflict him? Well, initially he said, you can't touch Job. You can really touch everything that he has, but you can't touch him. And then subsequent to that, he allowed him to touch Job also. Yeah. But not kill him. No. It's kind of interesting because it's kind of similar to this this judgment scene here, where you know first the devil comes and he takes everything from him, uh, but Job is not touched, and then he touches Job, but not allowed to kill him yet. All right, that's the first woe. We got two more woes to go, so uh, this is pretty dark stuff here. Let's take a look at uh, our passage for today, chapter nine, thirteen to twenty-one, and. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, would you mind reading that for us? Let's start with sure. the first paragraph, <laughs> just 13 to 19 for starters. Okay. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, the third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. Okay. All right. So the first woe is passed, and now we move on to the sixth angel, mm. second woe. Um, it begins in verse 13. Um, with each trumpet, there's some response to it, and things are happening. What's the first thing that happens? And this is important in verse 13. When the trumpet is blown, what happens next? The voice from the four the horns. I'm able to. Yeah, there's a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar before God. Notice that again. We're coming back to that golden altar. And that was the what what did we learn back in chapter six of that altar? What's what's happening at that altar? The martyrs. Okay. That's where the martyrs are. 
uh, and that's where they, their blood has been poured, and that's where they are crying out um, to the Lord, how long before you avenge our blood? It's, it's similar to the, the story of Abel in, uh, after Cain, is, Cain kills his brother, and his blood cries out to the Lord for vengeance. You'll notice that was back in chapter, uh, also chapter 8, uh, that the angel with the seventh seal, the, before the trumpets are blown, an angel stood at the gold at the altar with a golden censer, and then he throws uh, that the prayers of those saints uh, arise before the Lord, and he now answers those prayers. So we're coming back to that golden altar and crying out to the Lord uh, for justice, for vengeance. And the voice says, uh, this is the sixth angel, uh, the voice from the four horns of the golden all for God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet. Uh, so that voice commands the sixth angel. And what does it say? It release the four angels who were bound. The four angels who were bound. At the great the river, ladies. All right. So... What do we make of this one here? Um, these demons? This is a good question. Fallen angels, the four of them? Yeah, you know, given the couple things to note about this, we've, we've seen already that the Lord, if you remember, used Satan, the star fallen from heaven, Apollyon, Abaddon, as he's called, uh, to do his bidding to open up the floodgates for the demonic realm. There is a word here that makes me think that these four angels are uh, fallen angels. They are not uh, of the elect. Um, I don't know if you see what that word is I'm looking at. They're bound? They are bound, right? And you're going to see that where uh, Jesus talks about binding the strong man before you can uh, take his goods. Uh, it, it'll talk about Satan being bound at the end of Revelation uh, for the thousand years. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the angels that are, are bound, they're, they're kind of held back. They, they're, they're about really destruction. They serve a purpose. They serve a purpose in God's plan, as you see in these days of judgment. Um, and so everything is used. They don't have to be pure and perfect to be used by God mm -hmm. for his purposes. He uses these unclean, he, just like he uses vultures and, uh, and all kinds of animals that, uh, and bacteria and, and all sorts of things to, to do a, a disgusting but necessary work. And this is a horrifying work. But they're bound. And, and the phrase that's interesting is, and, and um, 2 Peter 2.4 talks about the fallen angels being held in chains Jude 1 6 talks about these sons of God that these fallen ones that are being uh, bound and uh, until the day of judgment. So they're held. In fact, let's take a look at them real quick. So 2 Peter 2, you can see he says that in the days of Noah, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. The word hell is not is not uh, Gehenna, is, is the everlasting fire. It's actually Tartarus is the, is the proper word, which was uh, a holding kind of prison for them. So they're, they're bound, they're kept in this place, and they're kept there until the judgment. That's when they are released. So these angels that are bound are now being released as part of the judgment that has come. You see it also in Jude 1, 6, And it says, the angels who did not stay in their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he's kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Mm. Okay. Now, a couple things about these. Uh, these are, this is not the devil. That was the prince of demons that we saw. These four, we've been talking about them in church on spiritual warfare, are these, um, they're like these four. These these fallen sons of God, these authorities, these rulers and authorities that Paul keeps talking about. They're the one third that went with Satan. Well, it's a little peculiar. It's um, 
So what you see in the scriptures is you see a couple of rebellions happening. In Genesis 3, you see the fall of the devil, the serpent, um, but it only records his fall. The next reference that Jude and 2 Peter refer to seem to be referring to Genesis 6 and the sons of God who were uh, these ruling authorities in the heavenly realms who were uh, rebelled and, and came and took, took the daughters of men and they have the Nephilim and all this craziness. And they, um, they are these rebellious authorities. Um, and so they are not, they're not the army of these angels, the third of the angels. They are of these rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. They have, and we see in the scripture that they're the ones who are given authority over nations. Um, they some of them are referred to as the prince of Persia in Daniel 10, or the prince of uh, Greece, these principalities, these powers. So the suggestion, it seems to be in the scriptures that each of the nations sort of has a ruling authority over them in the heavenly realms, a corrupted ruling authority. Um, so the, the angels, the third of the angels, I would argue, are, are sort of the troops, uh, just the, the troops that carry out all these evil plans or, or maybe these demonic horde that are being released upon them. But, um, but these are four angels. What was the significance of the number four? Uh, looking in all directions. Um, yeah. yeah, pertaining to the world, to all of creation. And so these four angels that are bound, um, and they're bound at the great river Euphrates. That term, great river Euphrates, is used several times in the Old Testament. Um, and I want you to, I'm going to pull it up and so you can see the references. And you tell me what it means here. Why, why, why are they bound up at the great river Euphrates? Who cares about that? But look at what these first three references here in Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. If you can see them, mm -hmm. what, what is your sense about the, the meaning of the great river Euphrates? What's the, what is that significance of that? Boundary? It is a boundary. Absolutely. And what is it a boundary of? Promised land. It is the boundary of the promised, the promised land. land. It, it, it's this clear and, and big, and the Euphrates is this great river. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a significant, it's not like the River Jordan, which is just a little stream at points. This is the great river Euphrates, mm -hmm. which is this, the, the boundary of the land that God promised to Abraham and to his yeah. descendants. So it's the, it's the symbol of basically everything on the other side of the Euphrates is under the domain of darkness, of the evil one. It does not belong to the Lord. And not only that, but when you look at the history of, of, of judgment against Israel, God sent the Assyrians first and then the Babylonians. They and all came from the north. They all came from the north. They actually, if you look at a map, you'll see that they came and they, they pretty much came from that other side of the U river Euphrates. They crossed that river and brought that judgment upon them. Mm. so let's come back to revelation 9 sorry <laughs> uh, 98 i'm gonna be in this for a while <laughs> all, right. Um, all right so uh the four angels uh who had been prepared um for the hour the day the month and the year uh, that's an interesting phrase here mm. What do you make of that? Verse 15, the four angels, they had been prepared for the hour of the day, the month, and the year. It seems weird because you would think if it would have been said the other way, because mm. he gives very specific. And then, uh, you know, normally you would say like the year, the, the month, the day, and then the hour. I, I don't know. It just seems backwards mm. to me. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, it's not, I see it's in the plan of God and it's never, it's not, it's not something that you just came up with. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You'll yeah. notice it's they who prepared them for this. Well, that that's the Lord who prepares them mm -hmm. and the precision of it so that there's no confusion. They are, they are let out. They're released at the exact, not just the exact, the year, 
and not just the month or the, even the day, but the very hour that they're released. Mm -hmm. You see this is the sovereign hand of God over them, that though they are bound and they are about to unleash a great terror here, this is from the Lord. We have to remember that. Um, they were released and their job is to do what? Kill a third of mankind. Kill a third of mankind. And, you know, one of the ways that uh, we talked about these, these angels, that these ruling authorities, what we see them in, in the scriptures in the Old Testament is these ruling authorities inspire and move uh, great empires to bring about God's judgment. So they, they move the Assyrians to come in and wipe out the northern king of Israel. They move Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to bring judgment upon Jewish. Judah. They move Cyrus to bring judgment upon the Babylonians. And they move Alexander to bring judgment on the Persians. And they move the Romans to bring judgment on the Greeks and so, and so forth and the barbarians. And so you see God using them. Uh, and so the killing of a third of mankind and, and the description of it is uh, of a battle scene, you could see where they are. Uh, this could perhaps be a literal third of mankind just perishing in horrific wars as we go forward here. But that third of a mankind would not include any of the uh, chosen. In this, in this vision, you're correct. That is, uh, and again, this is vision. Uh, right, it's, not, right. it's not a history. Um, and but the but those that are their their death is the judgment of God against them. And so it cannot be against any who are sealed uh, because they cannot experience judgment. They can experience they can be killed and martyred, but they cannot be uh, judged and, and killed. All right. It's so interesting that we um that it says prepared for the hour, day, month, and year, yet we're told no one knows when that's going to happen, but God knows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and those that say, well, um, yeah, I, I, I've known some people who've written books on, you know, when the Lord's coming, you know, yep. what it is. I've, you know, they have their 2012, 1988, you know, 2000, whatever. And they'll say, well, you know, no one knows the hour, right? But we can know the year. <laughs> that's, just, that's their theory. I'm like, no, I, I think this is, the Lord is sovereign over the hour, the day, the month, the year. There's just no, just stop guessing. Just stop. Yeah. yeah. Not even that's Jesus. Right. Yeah, at least on earth. Uh, when, when, he's, when he tells it on earth and, and none of the angels know. Um, this is, this mm -hmm. is a, the Lord's own secret. I almost feel like when Jesus got to heaven, it would be like, oh, that's when it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that whole thing works. But, you know, even at that point, when he says it on earth, he's like, he doesn't know. He doesn't have the date to give them. Mm. Uh, Only the father capacity. Knows. And but I'm sure in his uh, in his divine capacity, he would certainly know uh, mm. as he is all knowing at that point. Yeah. But coming along here, uh, it talks in verse 16 about the number of mounted troops now. Uh, twice 10,000 times 10,000. He hears their number. Um, but there, is a, there is a psalm that gives a little bit of reference to this. So we're, we're talking what's twice 10,000 times 10,000? 200 million. 200 million. That's a good mount. That's a, that's a good mm. size. Uh, especially at that time when population of the earth was probably not even that much um so 200 million troops that are coming um in psalm 68 it gives a little bit of a similar language eight, uh, 15 to 18 and uh we see a little bit of that um uh let's see uh bob would you read that bob thomas yep oh mountain of god Mountain of Bashan, O many peak mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O many peak mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode? Yes, where, where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. 
Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascend on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the, that the Lord God may dwell there. Okay. In this context, uh, by the way, the mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, I don't know if you know what mountain that is in the Bible. Um, it's, it's also called Mount Hermon. If you've been to the Holy Land, you know that's the largest mountain in the area by far. It's, a, it's almost, I think it's like 9,000 feet high. It's much, much higher than any other mountain in the area. Um, and it's significant in the scriptures. Uh, Bashan is, is always sort of the source of evil. And the Mount, Mount Hermon, uh, in, the, in the Jewish uh, texts of like the Book of Enoch and some of the mythology that they held to, uh, Mount Hermon was the place where the angels met uh, and conspired against the Lord to, to go and take the daughters of men. So these sons of God, they, they met on Mount Hermon or the mountain of Bashan, and they bound themselves with an oath that they were going to do this rebellious thing. And so it's there that they, um, that, that became this picture of sort of the evil powers um, that, uh, and so here, even though it's a glorious mountain, it's a big mountain, it's looking on with envy and hatred uh, against God's mountain. Um, but it describes God's chariots and says, describes them as how many? Twice 10,000. Twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands, similar to the way that John describes these mounted troops, these twice 10,000 times 10,000. He hears their number. This is the only reference that kind of makes some sense of that text. Um, so when we come back to Revelation 9, and we hear the number of these troops, um, this is a reminder of that Psalm 68, and that these troops, these mounted troops, uh, as Psalm 68 tells us, are the chariots of the Lord. They are doing his bidding. I heard their number. Um, even though they are really of an evil type you know being released by evil angels yet they are doing the lord's work just like what happened with babylon nebuchadnezzar and the babylonians are a wicked empire yet they're doing the lord's work in bringing judgment upon his rebellious people and it, just like we read in ezekiel if you remember um what was, remember, what was the uh, whole point of the exile of those taken out of J Judah and sent off to Babylon? To Why save God... them. Yes, to save them, right? To pull them out. So because when judgment's coming on Jerusalem, and by the time it comes, you know, God's people are, are removed from that. They're not facing that. They've been rescued by the exile, so to speak. But... That, that was the hard thing for them to get. It was like, how is it that these wicked people could be the chariots of God? Um, in this scene, they were. Uh, and, uh, and that's the whole, was it ha Habakkuk? Habakkuk, yeah. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, yeah. Habakkuk yeah. with that question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say Habakkuk is just floored that God is going to do this. And God raises up the Babylonians to serve him. And, and in the final analysis, he smacks them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 you know, they do his bidding, and then he, and same thing with the Assyrians. Yeah. He, he calls them his the axe. Shall the axe vaunt itself over the one who hews it? And that these the Assyrians were an axe in the Lord's hand, doing his bidding of destruction. You know, he uses wicked people to do his purposes, um, but he still holds them accountable. Um, so we see here. These chariots, as horrific as they are, there's a couple of things in this passage that remind us that they are the Lord's chariots. And one of them is just simply the number of them, that twice 10,000, that's the chariots of the Lord. When we get to the next part here, he describes the horses in his vision. And the, the bre they wore breastplates, the color, and the, the, the threefold color here is of what? Um, Fire and sapphire. Okay, we got fire, 
and we got sapphire. Sapphire. Sulfur. Sulfur. That's an interesting combination. You're not going to find that combination really anywhere else. No. Scriptures. Um, fire and sulfur. Well, we've seen those. We've seen lots of fire and sulfur. Uh, where do we see fire and sulfur in the Bible? Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Perfect place, right? Genesis 19. It's fire and sulfur on the people. Fire and sulfur clearly bringing judgment, but sapphire. Um, sapphire is a little different. Uh, what color is sapphire, by the way? Blue. 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 I had to look that up. I had no idea what color that was. Um, but there's a couple places where sapphire is mentioned. One is um, Exodus 24, verse 10. The breastplate? Uh, it, is, it is one of the stones uh, on the breastplate for... Uh, um aaron but the first time we read it is, is exodus 24 10 and um uh, raymond uh, would you read that for us can you see it oh you're, you're muted there can can you hear me now yeah we got you i had to change computers because i lost you and uh, they, no saw, they saw the god of israel there was under his feet as it is were a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. Yeah. This is Moses and the elders. When they went up, the Lord brought them up to Mount Sinai. And while they were there, they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet is what? Pavement, pavement. of sapphire yeah. stone. Okay. There's another passage too, and that is um, where are we here? Ezekiel ten. At the uh, base of the uh, new heaven, new earth. Yeah, on the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above them something like a sapphire in appearance, like a throne. So the the the, the sapphire comes to represent this throne of God, this heavenly mm -hmm. realms, the the whole blueness of it is perhaps the reason sapphire is chosen you know you look to the sky and you see the blue and so you're thinking that's the that's the throne of god there and uh you know that's the amazing thing that, that when, with, when the sun is out uh, like when god is on his throne the sky is blue and so the whole the whole pavement of god's throne room is of sapphire and these um, perhaps is why uh, John references their, the colors of these. Um, like it's almost like their uniforms, right? This is their uniforms, mm -hmm. um, and the, the uniforms are important because they represent, you know, where they're coming from, who's sending them. Um, it's not just fire and sulfur, um, but they're coming with the color of sapphire too. So, what might that all mean as you think about that? Why? Sapphire, red, uh, blue, and I guess yellow, right? Because they're coming from God um, in that they're um, doing judgment. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think they are, the, the colors are representing their who's sending them and their purpose for their being sent. Mm -hmm. These are coming from the Lord, from heaven, uh, bringing judgment. There needs to be no mistake because the, why is all this happening? Why are these people suffering like this? Why is all these miserable things happening to mankind? These poor people. Why is that happening? Judgment. For what? Sin. For not believing in God. For not being uh, like this. Yes, yes. But more specifically, you remember? Remember the author. Because they were the ones that, that uh, oh, the, uh, oh, people under the altar. They were the ones that slain them. Yeah, they, 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 for shedding the blood of God's people. He's avenging the blood of his people here. Gotcha. This is very personal. This is not just, you know, oh, they did a little things here and there. It's he's avenging the blood of his people. That's the whole the picture of this. All mankind participated in this. Um, and his, he's rising up in vengeance now. If it was just for committing sins, yeah. just generic sins um 
this seems awfully fierce and much too severe. But when you start to understand it as God is a father and he is bringing vengeance on behalf of his children who have suffered at the hands of these people. Uh, and particularly, you know, the whole, that's why unbelief and rejecting Christ is so significant because we're rejecting the son of God and God will not have his son scorned. Uh, so we see that part of it. So this is coming from the Lord in judgment. He describes the heads of the horses and the tails of the horses. Um, describe, describe the horses, kind of strange scene here. Uh, we're looking at verse 17. Uh, what about the horses' heads? They're like lions' heads. Lions' heads. Lions' heads. Um, and fire and smoke and sulfur come out of their out mouth. Of their mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what's uh let's talk about the mouths of lions here. Um why why uh interesting. The smoke, fire, and sulfur come out of their mouths. Well, like we said, said before said before that, that it's the teeth of the lion that you fear. Yeah, you know, that's, that's their main weapon. Yeah. Yeah. And and also the the with the teeth, the roaring of the lions here coming with fierceness, yes. Um, and these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. Uh, the three fleet, the three plagues uh, are, in verse 18. Fire and smoke and sulfur. Fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. And again, those three terms are calling us back again to Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, of God's judgment. The, the Sodom and Gomorrah is, is really an important one because it's, it's the one time you see God's absolute judgment coming straight from heaven to mankind on earth in such a traumatic way. Um, you know, the, the, the flood of Noah's day is similar, but it's, um, it doesn't have the same intensity. It's, uh, as the as Sodom and Gomorrah, there's the fire and the sulfur. And then remember, Abraham sees the smoke coming up mm -hmm. from Sodom and Gomorrah, like the smoke of a furnace. Mm -hmm. um, so Sodom Michael? and Gomorrah really become the, the picture of the final judgment coming. Yeah, yeah, Bray. Mark, is it possible for people to be saved during this time? Well, or again, this... yeah, I, I would say uh, what we're, what we're, we're not seeing a history of the future. Uh, okay. It, it's really just kind of painting the picture for us of the way that God judges and yeah. the way that he's unfolding it. Uh, we don't know, you know, there's, I, I would say it's the, the, all those who are sealed are not experiencing this. Um, and, you know, that's, this is the judgment. So it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of unfolding it for us in, in a vision's terms, um, yeah. So you're seeing the, um, you know, the judgments of God in a big way, but it, 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 I don't think you can take any more out of it as far as the, how things play out, because Jesus does say when judgment comes, how's it going to come? Fire and smoke. It's, yeah, it's, gonna, it's, it's also going to come like a thief in the night. You know, there's no, uh, when he returns, it's like, there's no time to repent. There's no time for anything. It's, it's boom, it's done. This is kind of, you're beginning to see God's judgments playing out in, and this is the tricky part of Revelation. Is it, is it referring to the very final judgment day, uh, the judgment of the entire world? Or is it referring to uh, what happened in 70 AD when the Lord brought final really judgment on Israel um, when the Romans came in? And there, is, there, there are times and seasons where God brings judgment on a people, like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, like he did Egypt, like he did Israel. Um, and then there's the final judgment of the end of the world. So there are principles with each of them I think we can apply. And it's just tricky in Revelation to know, is he referring to uh, events that have not yet happened? or for us, or is he referring to things that were happening or soon to happen in his time? 
mm. because it's a traumatic moment is about to happen in uh, in Israel uh, when in 70 AD. And Jesus. It's interesting. Seems to... It's interesting how they people wrestle over the date of the book of Revelation yeah. to make that yeah. point. Some say 95. It was written, others say 60, which would allow the 70 AD vision. Yeah. And, and I, I, I lean more toward that 70 AD because that John keeps talking about this as something that's soon to happen. He keeps warning them that this is soon going to happen. It's imminent. Don't close the book. It's going to happen. Uh, he doesn't talk about it like something that's going to happen a couple thousand years from now. He, he really talks about it like, you know, it's, it's imminent for them. So it's, it's trick. It's, it's not easy. And that's why I'm, I'm very careful with Revelation as far as the kind of things to, to talk about how things are going to play out because it's not so uh, easy to figure out. Um, but I don't want to miss the main points of it, which really speak to the character of God and the way that he deals with the world and the way that he deals with his people. Uh, there's a lot of encouraging word in it for us. But he also tends to repeat things over time. So yeah. although this may have been for 70 AD, yeah, it may also be, I mean, this is how he showed his wrath at that time. It says that he could also show that type of wrath at the end times. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, you, you can't, you know, and again, there's a lot of unknown here of how it all plays out. I think, I think that's why I think the safe, safe way to look at it is to see these as visions um, to help us understand the character of God and the way that he, he behaves. And, and, the, and John uses a lot of symbolism that is going to be of great significance. So coming back to these lions, these horses with lion's heads, but then they have tails. And what are their tails like? Serpents. They're like serpents. So you have lions and serpents, lions and serpents. What, what, what could that possibly mean? Lions kill, but serpents inflict pain. Now they both kill. <laughs> they oh. both inflict pain. But the, the lion, who is compared to a lion and a serpent? Satan was uh, Samson. Jesus was uh, a lion and Satan was a serpent. It's interesting. They're both kind of Jesus. That's really interesting because Jesus says he's the lion of Judah, right? But then he also mm -hmm. says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the serpent, so the son of man will be lifted up. Um, but Satan is referred to as a roaring lion seeking to devour, and uh, he's also the ancient serpent of old. These are uh, dangerous, and both of them are, are killers. Uh, both of them strike and attack, and uh, in this case, the lions and serpents together, there is actually a passage that kind of brings them together. I think it's in Isaiah. Let me find it here. Isaiah 9, 13 to 17, is that the one? <clears throat> uh, let me see if that's the one here. Did I get this? Oh, that's not the one, huh? Uh, wrong passage. Let me try and lion and serpent. There's a passage that kind of brings them together. You got to spell it right, though. <laughs> yeah, I got to spell it right. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Psalm 91. Um, he says to his people, actually, he says this to um, the Lord. Uh, this is what Satan says to Jesus, if you remember. He will command his angels concerning you to guard mm -hmm. you in all your ways. Remember that? Yes. Mm -hmm. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Now, Satan, when he quoted that to Jesus, says that he's the you. He's the one uh, and his people. So uh, that promise that you will tread on them, the lion and the serpent, who were the, the greatest fears of the people at that time, and uh, became representations of, of the evil and destruction. So here, these, uh, these horses that are coming are bearing the image of, I keep doing that, um, of the lion and the serpent from both ends. Um, and well, it's kind of interesting at this point because it is Satan, the lion and the serpent doing the, 
uh, doing all of this, but he's doing it at the, at the direction of Jesus. Yeah. You know, yes. So, yeah. In some respects, it, it represents both of them. Yeah. And it's both ends. There's a sense in which, you know, with, uh, with a lot of animals, if you can get the right position on them, you can avoid some danger here. Cause you know, every animal has its striking point. And if you can kind of avoid that, get behind it, you know, you can find a way to sneak away. In this case, you know, it's not just the heads of these horses that are dangerous. Their tails uh, mm -hmm. are dangerous too. Um, and they are about to wound and to uh, strike. But we know serpent. that Jesus is going to step on the serpent's head and kill it. Yeah. So um, it's just like Babylon. Um, he allows them to come in and take away Judah and then Babylon falls. Yeah. 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 And every uh, he brings his judgment. He has his way. And he, he you know, this he will the serpent strikes the heel of the. Uh, of the son of the woman and the son will crush the serpent's head so mm. now it's in their mouths is their power and this is where it gets a, it's kind of interesting um the mouths of the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their mm. tails um and their tails <laughs> are like heads serpents heads there and by means of them they wound um the striking the the, the the mouths being the um, is, is a significant part of the devil's work here. Just like the Lord comes and, and with the power of his word, he saves people. By the word of the Lord, you know, he creates everything and saves things. And we see that in, the, in Revelation that the devil, when he operates, also uh, destruction comes from his mouth. Remember the dragon, he, you know, he floods, uh, the, the water just floods from his mouth. Everything comes from his mouth. And you see that with, uh, I think it's in Psalm 30, uh, Psalm 3, maybe it is, where he says, uh, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies in the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. There's always this hitting him in the mouth, there's something about punching him in the mouth. Besides the, the teeth here, what is it that's coming from the devil's mouth that is wreaking havoc and causing oh, great destruction? The fire and smoke. From fire software. and smoke, yeah. Which are symbols of what? God's Judgment. wrath. Judgment, right? And so the, the devil is called, we see, as the accuser of the brethren. He's the one who is bringing the condemnation and is that's sort of his purpose is he is he is he's there to bring about the awful judgments of god and uh, from his mouth he accuses and condemns and for the world he is speaking truth confused uh, but for the believer uh, god is justified he cannot condemn though he tries and so he comes that's why so much of the focus is in the mouth of them bringing the accusations the slander the uh the judgments and and you see how powerful that is i mean how many how many people young people have committed suicide because of what others have said to them you know yeah just didn't didn't do any physical harm to them they just spoke words to them yeah. you know and it and it brought them into absolute despair and even self destruction that's the power of words isn't it yes and, and so when with this whole demonic realm here we're, we're seeing sort of this horrible stuff happening of judgment and um a lot of it the way it's kind of presented it's like huh the devil is not necessarily wielding weapons of warfare here he's not taking up swords and shields and guns but 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 words and ideas and uh either false teachings or uh, slander or just talk, you know, horrible things. And, and uh, he can do a lot of torment and damage through those means too. All right, but coming away with this, this is again, we have to remember with all this evil happening, this is of the Lord. He's behind it, even though he's using evil things. But let's, 
look at verses 20 to 21, and we'll finish there. Um, and we leave off here. Claudette, would you read that for us? rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Okay. Mm. So after all this, after all these woes have passed, after all these judgments have come, we haven't even hit the, four, the, the seventh trumpet yet, the third mm -hmm. woe. What are we told about mankind? It's, they're not repentant. They did not repent. Yeah, not that they couldn't, but that they didn't. They did not. Yeah, you're right. They did not repent of the works of their hands, and they didn't give up worshiping demons. Now, keep in mind, who's been tormenting them? Demons. Demons, and they're yeah. still worshiping them. Uh, and this phrase, by the way, the idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, uh, we've we've heard that before. That that list of elements there: gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. I don't know if you remember this, uh, but this is in Daniel five. Remember Belshazzar? Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see this here. Let's see. Uh, Bob Thomas, would you just read that for us? Just that first four verses. Uh, uh, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousands. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, be brought that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the kings and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Yeah. You remember the scene here. Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and he is having a feast, a drunken feast, and he brings out the, 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 the holy vessels that were taken from the temple. And he uses them to drink and to toast and to praise the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. That's what John is referencing here, the gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood. And um, what becomes of Belshazzar? What happens, if you remember? Um, it's not good. Yeah, I don't remember. A writing, a hand yeah. writing he, he, he was fingered. He was fingered. Yeah, the fingers of a human hand appeared. <laughs> And they wrote on the plaster wall, many, many Tekel Parson. And it was that night that Babylon falls. And it's mm. for them. Final judgment for Babylon. And it happened so quickly. And Persia just took over. It was like a coup. The Persians just come in, they sneak in, they kill him, and they take over the government. And everything is now, now the king of Babylon has suddenly become the kingdom of Persia. Overnight like that. It's one of the fastest judgments you've ever seen to, for a nation, for, for the Babylonian Empire, as great as it was, to literally fall overnight like that. Yeah. And that was the scene. And they're praising the gods of silver and bronze, iron and wood and stone is what it was the last thing they did before the trumpet blew and game over. And that's kind of the I think that's the reference that John is giving us here. In Revelation 9 is that the people of the world are like that king. Um, even worse than that, they've already been warned, they've received their plagues, and they keep worshiping demons and the idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, these worthless idols, and they don't repent. They're murderers, their sorceries, sexual morality, or their thefts. 
And so you can, you can feel the tension right now. You're expecting now a finger of God to write on the wall for them. And that's going to be leading us uh, into the, uh, now we're going to wait on that seventh trumpet to blow. But before we get to the seventh trumpet, you'll when we come next time, you're going to see another interlude, It'll be a few mm -hmm. chapters, the two witnesses, the, the angel scroll, the woman and the dragon, all these things before we get to the, the beasts. There's going to be quite a lengthy interlude before we get to the last mm -hmm. trumpet to blow. So there's a lot more to come. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we'll break it there. Uh, any comments or questions before we go? Uh, I, I like it uh, in the New Testament. You, you talk about the seals and the forehead of God. And, and I like that passage in the New Testament that says that we are sealed by the spirit of God onto the day of redemption. Yeah. Uh, there's a connection there. I like that. Yeah, it uh -huh. really is encouraging. And, and, you know, when we read this, you know, we should be, um, as, as horrifying as the images are for us, there is a level of joy and this is justice. This is God's answering the prayers and bringing his judgment and putting an end to the wickedness and the evil. Um, so this is, this is not a, it's a terrifying day, but it's not a bad day. This mm -hmm. is the Lord accomplishing his purposes and you know, we rejoiced, and you remember how we rejoiced when Bin Laden was caught and, and killed. You know, we found that news that he was finally captured and put to judgment. That was a good day. You know, when Hitler, you know, committed suicide, that's a good day, you know, mm -hmm. because it means freedom for those who've been oppressed for God's people. And, uh, and things are being made right finally. And, so, uh, and this is from the Lord. So we'll stop there. All right.